<laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to Parsha Pump Up for the last time in Safer Bamidbar. Next week, we'll be moving on to uh, well, next week. We actually won't be having class because of uh, Tishbov. And uh, the following week, we'll be having class in Yerushalayim as we start Safer uh, Bamidbar. Mirza Hashem. Parsha's Matos Mase is a Parsha that uh, is the, as I said, the final Parsha as the Jewish people are coming close to uh, the, uh, the border to the land of Israel. Uh, they have a major battle done, and actually it happens to be that uh, there's a lot of fascinating halachos that we learn, a lot of fascinating uh, that we learn in, in, these, in, in these two Parshios, in Parshas Matos Mase. Uh, with regard to the Battle of Midian, we learn the laws of Kaf, um, uh, because we uh, received a lot of bounty uh, from having won the war, and it was all from, uh, uh, from non-Jews, and therefore we had to know how to kosher it, how to, to, with the laws of toveling, all come from this week's Parsha. But the beginning of the Parsha discusses a, a, a mitzvah, a halacha, that is when you stop and actually contemplate it and think about it, it's actually quite mind-blowing. But we'll get to that in just a minute. I want to begin with a Gemara, a Gemara that hopefully will put into a frame of reference some of a, uh, a perspective of what we're supposed to be thinking about as we come closer to Tisha B'Av. But this Gemara is a, a, a fascinating Gemara and also uh, a little bit of a troubling Gemara when you first read it. At first glance, prima facie, this Gemara uh, will, will just not seem to click on, a, on an emotional level. What the Gemara says, the Gemara says, but on an emotional level, it just doesn't seem to click. Listen to, the, listen to what the Gemara says. Um, Rabbi Yehuda, um, Rav. Rabbi Yehuda said the name of Rav. What does the Pasuk mean when it says the following? This is a Pasuk in Yirmiyahu, uh, outlining the destruction of the temple of Yerushalayim, uh, really the, the exile that we are still experiencing from the land of Israel, uh, where God... Uh, poses a question. Mi ha'ish, ha'chacham v'yevin ezos. Who is the wise person who knows how to understand why the destruction of the temple of Yerushalayim, of the land of Israel entirely, why did that destruction take place? This is a question that is posed by God through the Navi. Who can understand such a thing? Davar zeh, the Gemara tells us that this question was asked to the Chachamim, to the wisest of the generation, to the Nevi'im, to the, to, to the prophets of the generation, the Lo Pirshuhu, and they were not able to answer the question. The, they, they, they got stumped. They could not answer such a question as to why did the destruction happen? Understandably so. You ask someone, why did the Holocaust happen? How could someone possibly give an answer to that? It's, it's an impossible question to answer. So it's understandable then why the wisest of the generation and even the prophets couldn't answer why the destruction happened. Today, we know based on a number of different Gemaras that probably the most popular reason as to or the most, uh, the, the most conventional uh, reason why the uh, Beis Amigdash was destroyed is because of baseless hatred, which we could relate to in that if we are not able to uh, be there for one another and to connect with unity to one another. So it's understandable that the house in which God proclaims to be kibesi based amim, that it's supposed to be a place that it is of complete unity in the service of God. Okay, so then it's not going to shtim. You can't put the two together. They don't jive. If you're not going to have unity, you're not going to care about one another. So then at the same time, you're also not going to be able to have the luxury of having the temple. Okay, we, we could wrap our head around that. It kind of makes sense to us. But then look at what the Gemara says over here. Below Pirshu, no one was able to answer the question why the destruction happened. Ad Sher Pirshu HaKadosh Baruch Hu Ba'atzmo. Until God came and revealed the answer. Dichsiv as the Pasuk says, Vayomer Hashem, God said, continuing in that Pasuk, God said, Al Ozvam Es Torasi, that it's because they've forsaken my Torah. 
because they left the Torah, they left the way of the Torah, therefore the land was destroyed. And according to the colloquial understanding of that, one of the roots of the Torah, and according to Hillel, it is the entire foundation of the Torah is, the is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And therefore, without that unity, so the Torah, without that, that the unity that is represented by the Torah, without that, so they, okay, fine. Then the destruction took place. That's the most conventional way of understanding this episode provided to us by the prophet. However, Rabbi Yehuda, in the name of Rav, in the Gemara, in the Dharam, right here, on the Pe Aleph, tells us something that is very difficult to understand in his interpretation of this puzzle. Hainu, what does this mean? That the reason that, the, that, that we lost the land is because we left the way of the Torah. Hainu lo shamu bikoli. It means that we did not listen to the voice of, of God. Hainu lo halchuba. You didn't walk in my ways. Amr of Yudah Amarav. What does this mean? She'ein. She'ein mevarchin b'Torah chila. That we did not recite the blessings upon the Torah. You know, before learning Torah, every single morning, we have an obligation, an obligation actually from the Torah. It's one of the two blessings that have the status of a, of, of a biblical commandment. All other blessings are rabbinic. So, for example, I'm about to make a blessing on my coffee. This just happened to be. This was not a planned prop. So that blessing that I just did was a rabbinic institution, a fulfillment of a rabbinic institution that I just completed. However, there are two blessings that have biblical origin. One is benching. As the Torah says, v'achalta v'savata u'beirachta. A great joke that I like to make is that the Torah, is, the, the Torah says that v'achalta v'savata u'beirachta, that you have to eat, you're satisfied, and once you're satisfied, you're benched. It doesn't say barachta. Barachta means to run away in Hebrew. It's not eat, be satisfied, and barachta, run away. It's beirachta and bench. So that is one of the, the, the two blessings that is of Torah command. The second is, uh, is, is the bracha of Birchas Torah. As is explained by the Gemara Brachas of the Chafalif, Kishem Hashem Ekra Habu Gadol Eloheinu. That when you engage with the name of God, which we know is through the Torah, so then we need to make a declaration for God. And that's through a blessing. So Birchas HaTorah, the blessings we recite on learning Torah, which we do in the morning, one of the first things we do, that is a biblical commandment. And apparently during this time, Birchas HaTorah was not being recited before learning Torah. And it's for this reason, says Rabbi Huda Amarav, that the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. So hold on one second. When you read the Rishonim, and you learn through the major commentaries on this Gemara, so contextually, it doesn't really make much sense that how could it be that that generation did not recite Berchas HaTorah? How did the Navi refer to people of that generation. There were wise people. There were chachamim, like the, the wise son of the Seder, the chacham, right? He, he's, he's, got, he's, got, he's got the yarmulke, he's got the tzitzis. He's, he's like a, a colloquial yeshiva guy. You look at any of, the, of, 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 the, of those illustrated haggadahs, he's always, he's always marked up the same way. He's always stri- he always takes the role of being the tzaddik. There were chachamim and nevi'im, prophets. You mean to tell me the prophets didn't recite Birchas HaTorah? Such a simple mitzvah? Something that every Jew that comes to pray in the synagogue on a daily basis is something that they do. However, chachamim and nevi'im, which are not allocates we give to anyone. These are not roles that are played by any person in Gal Yisrael. It's a select few that they didn't say Berchus HaTorah. And we know that that generation was involved in Torah mitzvahs. In fact, the Gemara Numa tells us, the Gemara Numa says 
that the reason the first temple was destroyed is because they were involved in the worst of the worst of Averos. They were, they, the people were involved in They were involved in promiscuity, in murder, and in idolatry. They're the worst of the worst of Averos. Averos you have to give your life for before committing. However, the Gemara says, the Gemara continues and it says, it says, however, during the sem- second temple period, period, Shahayu Oskim Betorah U Mitzvos, that they were involved in learning Torah and doing mitzvos and Gemilus Chasadim. They were Frumayin. They were religious people. You mean to tell me that, that they didn't say Berchas Torah? It just doesn't seem to make any sense. So the Ran, Rabbeinu Nisim, who's one of the Rishonim, he has a commentary on only a few Masechtas. He has a commentary on Masechet Brachos that are recorded by his students, the Talmidei Rabbeinu Yona, and he has a running commentary on Masechet Nedarim that is like gold, the Divrei Chaim of Tzans. The Divrei Chaim of Tzans, um, he was one of those unique Gedolim from the Hasidic uh, Velt who was not just uh, steeped in, in Jewish thought, as many Hasidic Sherebas are famous for, but he also was respected by, by the Lithuanian Jewry, who, whose main focus was, was analytical study of Torah in Talmud, in Mishnah, in Halacha, and the Divrei Chaim of Tzans earned respect in both camps. So he used to say that Gan Eden, uh, for him, is sitting with a, with a Masechet Nidarim, with the commentary of the Ran and a smoke. That's to him, Gan Eden. It was before, I guess, they knew that smoking was bad for you. They probably assumed then that it was healthy for you. But that's, it. that's what he said was Gan Eden, to sit with a Gemara Nidarim, with the commentary of Rabbeinu Nisim, of the Ran and a Shmef. Says the Ran that, of course, they said Birchus Torah. However, they did not appreciate the lessons contained within Birchus Torah. Take a look, take a look at now, we have to, we, we have to, we have a mission now to appreciate, well, what is it that they did not appreciate about Berchus Torah in order so that we can learn from their mistake, in order so that we can build the Beis HaMikdash again, and in order so that this coming Tisha B'Av, which is only in about 10 days from now, we will be able to, Be'ezrat Hashem, be dancing in Yerushalayim. So how can we learn from this mistake? What was it about Berchus Torah that they were missing? Which message in Berchus Torah did they not get? So the Torah in this week's Parsha starts, as I mentioned, with a halacha, which is a very important halacha. It's the halachos of nidarim, of creating oaths and vows, where the Torah says, Ish ki yidor neder la Hashem, or ish if someone takes an oath or a vow, to swear off something, in order to create a prohibition upon them. So for example, let's say um, I, uh, the doc- I have a doctor who tells me that I'm drinking too much caffeine. So you know what, I'm, I, but I know that you know, for me, I love, my, I love coffee so much. Actually this week, I, our, our Nespresso machine wasn't working 100%, so I actually today needed to package it and send it back to the manufacturer for them to fix. And I, I, it was... It was it was such a difficulty for me to drop off the package at the <laughs> postal annex at Ralph's because I knew that that meant for the next couple of weeks, I'm not going to have my delicious cup of coffee. And, but I know I drink too much coffee, but you know what? It's too tempting for me. So what I'm going to do is that so that I don't uh, have to worry about my own, um, uh, uh, my, my own uh, uh, you know, self-control, I'll create a prohibition upon myself. The same way that I wouldn't think twice about going into Carl's Jr. and picking up a number three special. So in that way, I want coffee to be like that. So the Torah gives me the power, le'esor isar al nafshaw, in order to create a prohibition through my speech. Lo yachel dvaro, says the Torah, I am not allowed to violate my speech, meaning that once I make that declaration, Drinking coffee to me would really be like getting a, a, a number three special from Carl's Jr. Whatever comes out of my mouth, I need to commit. A man is only as good as his word. This is exactly what the Torah is teaching us over here. 
the, the, the obligation to follow your oath and the prohibition if you were to defile your oath or your vow. If you were to drink the coffee, even though you sweared it off, that would be a prohibition from the Torah. So the Gemara in Mesech Nedarim on Dav Tesayim poses a fascinating um, uh, dilemma that would come up. What's the dilemma? Let's say, let's say, let's put aside the coffee example. What if, what if I sweared off etrogan? An etrog. Now, I need an etrog for the holiday of Sukkot. But for whatever reason, let's say it was, um, you know, in the middle of December, okay, or right now. And for whatever reason, I got really turned off by citron. And I want to, 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 to swear off citrons, etrogim et, et from my life for whatever reason. And you could imagine a reason. But that's what I want to do. And I create a vow to do so. So hold on one second. Comes along Sukkot. And the Torah tells me, that on the first day of Sukkot, I have a commandment to take for myself a pre Hadar, which the Gemara and Sukkot tells me, a pre Hadar is an Esrog. Along with three other species, I bind them together, Ka'agudas Ezov, and I have to um, lift them up and take them for the holiday of Sukkot. Hold on one second. I'm not allowed to get any benefit from etrogim. When someone vows off a certain, a certain item, so let's say the coffee, for example, it's not just about drinking coffee. It's about getting any benefit from coffee. So let's say my doctor tells me that, you know, if let's say I have a certain rash and the doctor tells me, you know, a great way to treat that would be by washing your hands in coffee. I am not allowed to do so because I have sweared off coffee. Any benefit from coffee. So the esrog is the same thing. I have a dilemma now. Now it's sukkis. I swear it off at trogim. I want to be able to take lul of an esrog. I can't take it without an esrog. So what am I supposed to do? So take a look at what it says in Shulchan Aruch. Nedarim chalim al bar mitzvah. That the neder is chal. The neder will apply to the esrog. Oh my gosh. Ketzad. How so? Amar konam sukkah sha'ani yoshev. Lulav shani no tell asar leshev basuka velito lulav. That if I were to say such a thing, I would not be allowed to perform the mitzvah. I would not be allowed to receive benefit from sitting in the sukkah or 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 taking the lulav. But the Gemara makes a very important distinction. The Gemara makes a distinction between whether or not you are receiving whether or not your your vow was on the object was on the object which if it is then yes that would be a problem or if it was on the fulfillment of the mitzvah if it was on the fulfillment of the mitzvah so then your neder will not work why because even though even though you're right i wouldn't be able to get any benefit from esrogim the rest of the year. However, however, on Sukkot, when I pick up the esrog, in such a scenario, that would be called mitzvah lav lahanos nitnu. That when I perform a mitzvah, we don't treat that as me receiving direct benefit from the object. Why? Because why is it that we do mitzvah? because God commanded us to. Whether we enjoy it or we don't enjoy it, we have a commandment to do the mitzvah. Of course, it is ideal for someone to enjoy the mitzvahs that they do, to get pleasure out of performing mitzvahs. But even if a person does not receive benefit from doing the mitzvah, it's not something that's exciting to them, it's not something that is um, a, a beneficial to them in, in a you know selfish type of a way, so then, that's that, that's fine. You still you still perform the mitzvah. You still fulfilled the mitzvah. So if a person takes an oath that they are going to swear off at trogen, so then they still would be able to take the esrog. Why? Because mitzvos lavla nasnitnu. 
You're not performing the mitzvah in order to get benefit from the Esrog. You're performing the mitzvah because God commanded you to do so. Because God commanded you to do so, that's why you're doing the mitzvah. Not because you're trying to get benefit from the mitzvah. Mitzvos lav lanas nenu. And therefore, and therefore, you would be able to perform the mitzvah even though you sword off the etro. So now, this comes to the exception of one mitzvah. Let's say I swore off any benefit from my friend. A guy I, 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 can't, I can't stand. I, I, just, I can't stand a certain fellow. So you know what? I don't want anything to do with them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a halachic restraining order. I'm going to say that I'm not going to receive any benefit from you and you're not going to receive any benefit from me. I'm swearing off all of my things that you're not going to get benefit from me and I'm not going to get benefit from you, essentially creating a halachic restraining order. We essentially were cutting off ties from one another. But let's say I walk into shul and I've been looking all over the place for a certain Torah book that I'd like to learn. Let's say a chumash. For whatever reason, I can't find a chumash in the shul. Or the closest one near me is my friend's chumash. The one who is my friend that I created the halachic restraining order with. So what's the halacha? So you would tell me that I'm not allowed to read the person's book. Why? Because mitzvot slav la nesnetnu. That the neder is, will, will apply to the book because we don't learn Torah for the benefit of learning Torah. We learn Torah because God commanded us to. And mitzvahs lav on us, and therefore I would be allowed to learn his Torah. I would be allowed to learn the Chumash. Why? Because, again, I'm not learning it in order to strictly receive benefit. I'm, I'm learning because God commanded me to learn. It has nothing to do with receiving benefit from the person. And therefore, it should be no problem. Comes along the Shulchan Aruch and says, no, this is the one exception. Because im asar sifra al-chavero asar lil lilmodbo. That such a person would not be able to learn from the Chumash. Why? Because it would seem as though Torah is the exception to this rule of mitzvot slav lanas nenu. Again, even though in general we say that Mitzvos were not given strictly for our personal benefit. Mitzvos were given because we're, com- we're fulfilling a command of God. There's one exception to that rule. That the exception is Torah. Learning Torah in it of itself is supposed to be beneficial for us. The fulfillment of the mitzvah is to get benefit, to enjoy the learning itself. It's the only mitzvah like it. There is no other mitzvah that in its core is supposed to be for our benefit, for us to enjoy it. All other mitzvahs have the overarching thing that we discussed discussed a couple weeks ago, that really in in reality, every mitzvah is a chok, quote unquote. That every mitzvah we do because God commanded us to. Learning Torah, however, is the one exception to that. Learning Torah is for our benefit. We learn Torah because we want to enjoy it. We learn Torah to enjoy it, not for any other purpose, not because God commanded us to do so, but rather the highest level of learning Torah is to enjoy it. This is exactly what it says in Tehillim. It says in Tehillim that that the, the, the statutes, the precepts of God are yesharim, are just and mesam chelev. They create a rejoicing in the heart, which is, by the way, the reason why on Tishbab we're not allowed to learn Torah. There's a prohibition of learning Torah on Tishbab because we are we have to be in a state of mourning on Tishbab during Shiva. A person is not allowed to learn Torah because you have to be in a state of mourning. You're not allowed to do anything that's going to give you ex- excessive joy. Learning Torah gives a person excessive toy joy. It's part of the fabric of the mitzvah itself. Learning Torah gives us joy. You know, I, I, I have had the pleasure of learning just about 20 feet away from a Herschel Schechter in the, in the years that I was learning in Escola. I learned in Escola for about five years, and I was able to sit and, and watch the way that he learns Torah. He, he lives and breathes this mandate. 
where Torah learning is not just simply a mitzvah to do like any other mitzvah, but the, the purpose of the mitzvah itself is to give us joy. I once saw Rav Shechter uh, be, be stuck on a question on a certain Gemara. I saw him think for a long time. He quickly gets up to the shelf. He goes and he pulls off a chazonish. He saw a statement in the chazonish. He must have remembered at that moment. And I'm telling you, because I timed it, because I was just fascinated by it. From that moment, he was stuck with a smile on his face for close to 15 minutes straight. 15 minutes straight, he had a smile stuck on his face. He, I heard him giggling under his breath. He was so excited. Take a look at this picture. This is a picture of Rav Schechter with Rabbi Yosef Weiss. Rabbi Yosef Weiss passed away a couple of years ago. He was the, um, the Rebbe in NYU, the Rosh Shiva in NYU, who used to give the um, uh, who used to teach the uh, Hilchos Kashras, Yoradea. He used to teach Hilchos Kashras to the boys, and he did that for, I th think, about 75 years. He taught Hilchos Kashras to the boys for 75 years. It was unbelievable. He was, it was, I, I saw him one time, one time, but by the time I was in YU, he was already um, much older and he wasn't able to come in, but I did see him one time. So look at, look at, look, look at Rav Schechter's uh, um, uh, reaction to whatever they're learning. It's the biggest smile on his face. The learning Torah is the biggest smile on his face. You ever seen a smile on someone's face like that when they do any other mitzvah? Learning Torah is, the, is unique in that this is the fulfillment of the mitzvah, to learn, to, to, to learn Torah with a big smile on your face. It's the most gishmak, delicious thing in the world. Which is why I'm not allowed to use my friend's chumash. Because that will be me getting direct benefit from the person. Even though mitzvot in general are not for our direct benefit, they're because we need to fulfill a mandate of God. However, when it comes to learning Torah, it's not like that. Learning Torah is supposed to gladden the heart. That's the purpose of it. Take a look at the language of Birch Torah. With this in mind, we can understand why it is, if Nema of the Haaret, why is it that the land was destroyed? Says Amr of Yehuda Amarav, they shall birchu b'Torah Tchila because they didn't recite Berchas Torah first. Says the Ran, what it means is that they did, is that they, of course, they said Berchas Torah. However, they didn't appreciate Berchas Torah. Take a look at what it says in Berchas Torah. It begins with an opening bracha. Baruch Atah Hashem Elokeinu Melech Olam Asher Kidshanu BeMitzvos of Itzivanu LaAsok BeDivrei Torah. That God has commanded us to be osik, to be involved with learning Torah. VeHarevna, and then we have a plea to God. VeHarevna, and God, please make it sweet. Hashem Elokeinu Es Divrei Torah Scha BeFinu BeFios. Please, God, make your Torah sweet in our mouths. Because this is the way one fulfills the mitzvah of learning Torah, is if it is something that's a joyous occasion, not just a strict intellectual pursuit, but it's something that's supposed to give you enjoyment. And us and our children and and all of our future offsprings and generations. And through this enjoyment of learning Torah, we'll come to know your name. This is the fulfillment of learning Torah for its sake. Without having this in mind when we learn Torah, that it's supposed to be something that gladdens the heart, something that excites us, something that, that invigorates us. So then it's not going to continue on into the next generation. It's not going to continue. It's not going to continue on to the next generation. There's not going to be a continuity. There's not going to be a progener uh, uh, someone to progenerate the Masorah. It's just not going to happen. The tradition is going to stop without learning Torah. The Degel Machane Ephraim, or Moshe Chaim Ephraim of Mushbish, he was the grandson of the Baal Shem, who unfortunately also had a very, very short life. He lived from 1748. He died in the year 1800. He lived for 52 years, a very, very short life. He explains the Gemara and Adarim just like this, that why is it that the temple was destroyed? because they didn't appreciate learning Torah in the way we're supposed to learn Torah. In the way we're supposed to learn Torah, that it's supposed to be something that's invigorating, exciting, something that's supposed to gladden our hearts by doing so, so then you're able to apply the Torah in a much more lucid fashion. 
in a much more fluid way because it's something that's stuck with you. It's something you'll never forget. Think about the happiest moment in your life. Do you imagine if you had that kind of feeling every time you learn Torah? It shapes who you are as a person. That those joyous moments in our lives are things that shape us and, 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 and inform the way we act. If every time we engaged in Torah in that kind of a way, it would inform the way we act. It would inform the way that we interact with one another. It would totally change who we are as people. And by doing so, so then we, would have, we wouldn't have lost the temple. We would have been able to hold on to that unity if Torah is something that stuck in our hearts, says something that, that was stuck there and it just couldn't move because it was something that excited us. When you lose that excitement, so then it becomes a snowball effect and everything else starts to crumble away from the system. Then you start to, 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 to lose that connection between one another because it's the Torah that is supposed to bind the unity of the Jewish people. So Mir Tzashem, if we, if we, if, if we take a, a, an evaluation into this doctrine, of Pekude Hashem Yisharim Esam Chelev, of finding the joy in learning Torah, finding the excitement in learning Torah. So then by doing so, Torah is going to be something that has an effect on us. When it has an effect on us, so then we become better people. We care about each other more. We care about the world more. We care about the Jewish people more. We care about our neighbors more, our families more. And by doing so, so then the Mimher Biyamenu Yibana Beis Hamikdash, that the Beis Hamikdash will be rebuilt and that hopefully this year, Tishabav Tav Shin Pei will be miyagon le simcha, will be a simcha, and we'll be dancing in your slime together. Okay, we'll stop here. Thank you. Shkarech, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank my you pleasure. so much, Rabbi. Davis. Oh, the shear this week was sponsored by the Lotsaw family in honor of working bar mitzvah. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. And yashikot for them. All right. Very good. Have a good Shabbos, everyone. Great to have a wonderful Shabbos.